Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Let's see. Okay. So I um, hope you guys have all been enjoying the conference. Uh, I have as well. Um, I was listening to the talks from earlier and getting really intimidated by how funny all of them were. So just before you guys came in, I started adding some jokes to my slides. So <laughs> please laugh <laughs> if you come across anything that vaguely sounds like a joke. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so my name is Ire Adirinokun. People tend to struggle with my name, so this is kind of like the cheat sheets I give them. So the E is kind of like email, and Ray is like the Ray from Star Wars, and both these things encapsulate what I do with my life. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm from Nigeria, Lagos, which is uh, Western Africa. Although I just flew in from California, so I'm still a bit jet lagged. And if I say anything that doesn't make sense or I yawn, it's not because I'm bored by my own content. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I work at a company called IO. Um, I, um, they said we work on um, Adblock Plus and Flatter Plus. I also work with a company called Bitcoin, which is building cryptocurrency related products for Nigeria and African audiences in general. I'm also a Google expert in web technologies, um, which just means I do things with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And I also write a blog called Bits of Code where I talk about all these technologies. So first of all, uh, who are the next billion users? Uh, just quickly, show of hands, anyone who has heard of this term before? Okay, yeah, so a fair amount of people. Um, so basically this term is, I think it was coined by Google maybe about a couple of years ago, but it was basically just to address the problem of a company like Google who has about a billion users at the moment. Um, those first billion users were probably more of like a more restrained or specific demographic. So the first people who came online were probably more restrictive in terms of who they were compared to the next billion users who are going to come online. So it's kind of like addressing the problem of the shift in the audience of people who are coming online now versus the first people who did come online. If you Google the term next billion users, you'll probably come across images that look like this. So somebody in a real, really rural area, probably using a phone that's, I don't know, some of us have probably never seen in the past like 20 years or something. And outdoors, I don't know, <laughs> are they even living in a house or something? You kind of just see this kind of image. And although um, this kind of image or this stereotype of what the next billion users is, is kind of true, like there is a section of the next billion users that is this person, but it kind of puts it in a box that kind of doesn't allow you to see more than just this particular message. Because in actual fact, the next billion users, the concept of next billion users is just about talking about people who are starting to have access to internet in a way that they previously weren't able to maybe 20, 30 plus years ago. So for example, people who are coming online today because of advances in assistive technology, or people who, although they had access to internet, they might not have been able to access a lot of content due to language barriers, or even people like yourself or myself. So for this kind of category, I tend to think of it as us moving from the desktop to the mobile. So in a way, I kind of think of that as next billion users as well, because we're coming online in a completely new way. So until now, developing for the web was kind of synonymous with developing for users like you. And in this case, the emphasis is more on yourself. So generally, people from a developed country who have probably had access to a lot of technology and specifically the internet for the vast majority of their lives. And don't get me wrong, this is not to say that any of you are evil because you are developing for yourselves or that all the Western developers got together like 20 years ago and said they don't want to make websites that will work for people who were living in Africa or who need assistive te technology or anything like that. It was kind of just born out of the circumstance. So if you think about it, 20 plus years ago, the average cost of a computer was about $10,000. And that price alone restricts the amount of people who can even come online. If you don't even have access to a computer, how can you come online? <laughs> 
And this is also shown in this statistic that just 0.4% of the global population even had access to internet. And even further, things like assistive technologies at the time were virtually non-existent. So it really just didn't make sense to try and build for um, a user base that wasn't going to be able to come online. If you were thinking 20 plus years ago that you want to be a really good person and make a website available for or usable for a person living in Nigeria who was blind and needed to use a screen reader, that user just would not have been able to access your site at all. So there was no point in trying to build that kind of site. But obviously things have drastically changed now. Nowadays, you can get a mobile phone running Android 7 for something like $45, which is about 16,000 Naira. And then you can also get a Windows 10 machine for just about $250. And if you look at the drastic increase in the percentage of the global population with access to internet, going from 0.4% to, more, to the majority of users or people in general now have access to the internet. And then we also have a great increase in assistive te technologies. <laughs> um, a lot of machines that you buy out of the box come with something like a screen reader already there built in for free. So that really opens the world to a section of the population that may not have been able to access um, machines or the internet at all. So the next billion users is, like I said, just a group of people who are, who are able to access the internet and um, in a way that they are, sorry, <laughs> the next billion users is just a group of people who are able to access the internet today in a way that they previously wouldn't have been able to. So whether that is because they are now able to buy their first phone because it's now cheap enough for them to be able to do it, or because they're now able to get a mobile device because of the decreasing costs of that kind of technology. So some, something like you and I just sitting on the train being able to use a tablet. That wasn't possible not that long ago, but now it is. And building for these next billion users involves thinking about web development in a completely different way to how it previously was. And there are three, three, three key concepts that frequently come up. So the first thing is performance. And this is really important for the section of those next billion users that really cares about data. So for example, I mentioned any one of us maybe on the train where there's not good Wi-Fi or data is slow. And for someone like that, having a fast site is important because otherwise they probably would not be able to load it or it will just be really slow and they'll probably just give up. But there's also the section of the population that is coming online for the very first time because they're just able to afford their very first phone. And in all likelihood, that person is probably not going to be getting like an iPhone 10 or something. They're probably going to be getting something along the lines of like a Nexus or that $45 phone that I showed you earlier. And when you're using a phone like that, that's a lot more um, low end, Apart from the fact that it's slower, you're probably also going to be more conscious of the data that you're using. So this is a statistic that I like to show. Um, so in Nigeria, it takes the average person about 28 hours of work to be able to afford just 500 megabytes of data. And if you compare that to Germany, that's just about one hour. So for somebody like that, like living in Nigeria, who has to work 28 hours just to be able to load something like one or two sites, it becomes really important what sites that the person is using and um, how, how like, big it is, how, how um, fast it takes to load, and how important it is to them. So it's really important um, when you think about it that your site is fast not only for the people who want like a really, really snappy experience, but because a slow site actually really costs other people like their actual money. And that can be the choice between loading your sites versus buying something physical that they actually need. So the second concept is internationalization. And as the web is becoming more and more worldwide, as it was intentionally meant to be, People are starting to realize that English is not the only language <laughs> in the world and that um, many other people need to be able to access sites in different languages. So it's becoming more and more important to acknowledge the differences in the languages and I'll talk about that more in a bit. 
And finally, uh, as I mentioned, accessibility is also important. So because more people are now going to be able to access websites in different ways, then we need to actually start thinking about um, how to build our sites in a way that's more malleable and can be accessible in those ways. So if we think about it, maybe 20 plus years ago, you could pretty much guarantee that everyone going to your website is probably going to be using a mouse and a keyboard. But nowadays, you can't really guarantee that. Maybe the person isn't using a mouse at all and they're only using a keyboard to navigate through everything. Or maybe they're using a screen reader and using dictation to actually interact with things. You can't really know anymore, so we need to build our sites in a way that will work for all of these things. So how do we build our, or how do we write our CSS for these next billion users? And there are four things that I want to talk about, all the way from deciding if CSS is the right tool to use, and to how do we deliver the CSS that we eventually do write. So first of all, is CSS the right tool in the first place? Um, this slide, you guys have pretty much seen it like a couple of hours ago. I promise I didn't steal it, it was already in there. <laughs> but basically, if you only have a hammer, everything or every problem you're trying to solve looks like a nail. And this can be the same with CSS as well. If you are trying to do everything with CSS, you can start to see how you might think that, okay, maybe JavaScript isn't right for this or maybe HTML isn't right for this. And you can kind of see this by just searching CSS only anything, and you can see a lot of people have come up with really creative ways to do something only using CSS, so instead of using JavaScript for the most part. And it can be really easy to get caught up in this no JavaScript bandwagon, but we have to realize that there are different tools for different things, and um, finding a CSS-only solution to something isn't necessarily always going to be better. And that's not to say that these people are doing something like wrong or anything. It typically always comes from a really good place, which is of trying to provide experience for people that don't have JavaScript. But we can ultimately do more harm by kind of pushing away from what CSS was actually meant for. So as we know, we have these three tools, and they have their own um, corners of what they're really good at and what they're meant for. So we have HTML, which is meant for the content and the semantics. Then we have JavaScript, which is meant for functionality and interactivity. And then we have CSS, which is purely just for presentation. So although there are cases in which you could use CSS for things that you could do with HTML or JavaScript, they don't always make the most sense, and like I said, can ultimately end up doing more harm. So for example, if we decided that we wanted to use CSS to add labels to all our inputs, we could do that, and it would visually probably look the same as using an actual label element, but we're neglecting um, all the good things that we would if we had done this with HTML. So we're not getting any of the semantics. And if there was a user who was trying to access the site via a screen reader or something, they wouldn't be able to read that. So it's always better if you have something that's for HTML, like content, to just actually use HTML. And the same goes with JavaScript. So this is an example of a CSS only, okay, drop down menu. And um, I don't know if you can really see, but first of all, I'm just using my mouse to hover through all the things, and you can very easily access all the um, parts of the menu. But the second time I go through, when I'm just using my keyboard and tabbing through, I can only access the top three, and the rest of the content becomes inaccessible. But if you are just to use JavaScript, if this is working, yeah. So this is me just actually tabbing through only using the keyboard. You can see that everything is accessible within the menu. So the second part is selecting HTML. And as we know in this CSS rule, the highlighted part is the selector. And there are a few tips that I'd like to give on how um, we can select our HTML in a way that's like for the next billion users. And the first thing I want to mention is using naming conventions that are very globally aware. So this is an example of the Adblock Plus homepage. Um, we're in the middle of a redesign. <laughs> so this is what it looks like 
if it's in English, but this page is actually translated to a bunch of different um, languages. So this is what it looks like in Arabic, which is a right to left um, read language. And as you can see, um, everything is like flipped around. Everything that was previously going from left to right is now going right to left. And when we're naming the things that we are um, naming the elements on this page, it could be easy to do something like, um, for example, for the logo, if we're only thinking about English, we can just name it something like text left or something. But that doesn't really take into account what happens when we switch it around to Arabic because it's no longer on the left, it's now on the right. What we're actually trying to do is say that we want that logo to be at the start of the container, not necessarily at the left. So that's kind of what we do. We generally steer away from names that assume a direction, unless, of course, we do actually always want something to be at the left. So instead of doing something like this, which just assumes that left is always going to be the start, we would have a name, something like text starts, and this will be dependent on the context of whether we are in a left to right or a right to left um, direction. And a lot of the new CSS properties and values are also um, following this kind of technique. I'm sure you must have noticed that, especially with things like Flexbox and Grid, you see a lot of names that are like Flex Start or Start and Flex End or End. And this is also because they're acknowledging the fact that things don't always go in left to right. They can also go top to bottom, they can go right to left, they can go in any amount of way. And um, using something as strict or one-sided as left or right doesn't really acknowledge this. Another tip is to think about um, the performance of the selectors that you're doing. So um, this is just a simple example of like an unordered list with three list items and links within them. And if we wanted to select the um, anchor in the third list, there are many, many different ways we could do this. So this is just like a small example of all the ways that we can select that same element. So we can select it by looking at um, the href attributes, we can select it by looking at the list item, or we can select it by looking at the very convenient ID that have been placed there. But some selectors are more performant than others, and they are better to use in different situations. So I don't know if you can read that, but um, IDs are going to be the fastest or the most performant selectors that you can use, and then all the way down to pseudo classes and pseudo elements. So if you're given a whole array of different ways to select an element, you can kind of um, refer to this and think about which is always going to be the most performance depending on your use case. So if you have the opportunity to use an ID, you should just go that way instead of trying to use something like a pseudo element or um, an attribute. So this is just that other list ranks um, from fastest to slowest. So if there's an ID, you would use it, and then at the very end, you would use like a not attribute looking at the, um, at the href attribute. And this also goes for the naming conventions that you use. There are different ways, of course, to um, name the elements on the page. And some ways kind of encourage a more performant way of writing than others. So for example, if you have a button element, um, I don't know why I used the div there, that's like accessibility <laughs> horror story, but it, just imagine it's an actual button. Um, so you can have button icon primary or button primary, and one way to select it would be to have to jump through this hoop of making sure you're selecting only the buttons that aren't icons but are primary. And that's not necessarily the best way to go about it. If you were to use a naming convention more like this, you could just select the button primary class and not have to worry about the other attributes that are there. So you can have them be individual, individually um, stylable. So um, the third thing is the declarations. So here we have color bay, which is, I just learned about this color, and isn't it like the best thing ever? Um, so the first thing that we tend to ask when we're thinking about what properties to use is, oh, can I use this? And we go to canIuse.com and try and figure that out. 
But the first thing I think that we should ask is, do you actually need to use it in the first place? So an example I like to give is this is um, a grid um, <clears throat> that we created at IO. Um, so it's just a very basic four, two to four column grid. It's quite configurable because you can go reversed, you can go right to left, you can go reversed and right to left, which I think brings you back to left to right. I'm not sure. <laughs> But the really great thing about it is that um, this is what my colleague created, and he did the entire thing just using floats. And the reason for this was because we actually, for a lot of our websites, still have to support IE8, which was, they didn't tell me this when they hired me, but, <laughs> but you know, you learn. <laughs> so, um, so we just had to go with something like this that would work. And, I mean, it actually just works. And we just realized that even though we would love to use Grid or Flexbox, for the purposes of what we are trying to do, floats actually just work fine. So we don't need to exclude a certain amount of our um, users just to be able to use something that's like maybe a better developer experience. But sometimes when you ask the question, do I need to use whatever awesome thing that you're trying to use, the answer is actually, yeah, you do, you do need to use it because for whatever reason, you can't achieve what you're trying to do without it. And this is an example of a layout in which we did have to use one of the newer features. So we have these cards here, and as you can see, each element in the card is aligned against each other. So as you can see for the fourth, um, fourth card, even though the heading spans across two lines, the rest of the content is still like, uh, aligned together. And we couldn't actually recreate this without using CSS Grid, because we would have had to use um, like fixed heights for everything, and it would have been really not ideal. So we did actually use CSS Grid for this. But of course, like I said, we have to support IE8, and um, CSS Grid is not supported by IE8. And the way we got around this was by using feature queries, which is probably my favorite feature in CSS right now. And what we did was that we will have some fallbacks, which involves doing the really messy, manually setting up heights for things, but then for the other browsers that do actually support Grid, we were able to serve them like this better experience. So um, another tip would be about choosing more performance CSS properties. And um, just a bit of like to go back, um, this is what is called the critical rendering path. And this just explains what happens when the browser receives the HTML documents from the server. So it explains what happens between that point and when things are actually displayed on the page. So first of all, we have to build the DOM, and then we have to build the CSS DOM, and from that we build the render tree, then we go through layout, paint, and composite. And for this purpose, you don't really need to understand what any of those mean, just know that there are steps that you have to go through. And the thing that is important is that whenever you want to change or animate any of these properties, it can actually re-trigger stages of that critical rendering path. And that can be better or worse for performance based on which properties that you're choosing. So for example, if you want to move an element just a few pixels up and you decide to do, and you decide to do that using the top property, that's going to actually cause the layout paint and composite steps to be re-triggered. Whereas if you use something like the transform property, it's only going to cause the composite step to be re-triggered. So both of these things could still achieve the same effect that you want, but choosing one property over the other has a quite significant impact on the performance of your site. And um, this is a really good resource, cssstriggers.com. So it just lists pretty much every um, CSS property, and it will show um, what stages of the critical rendering path it will trigger if you change anything. So it's a really good resource. And looking at that, there are actually two properties that are the most performance, which are transform and opacity. So if you ever need to do animations, and you can get away with using just those two, that would probably be the best for your site. Another thing is to, as much as possible, respect the end user preferences. So one thing I would suggest um, taking a look at is reduced motion. 
So um, I think this is an iOS mainly thing, but if the user has said that they don't want things like animations, we can actually access those kind of settings in the browser and turn off things like animations. And that's just a really nice way to kind of look into what the user needs and kind of respond to that. So a lot of the times there are situations in which the person has turned this off because they might have um, special needs or they might have certain reactions to things like animations. So if we can do something like this to um, turn that off, that would be a really great experience for the user. And another thing is important. So I mean, there are many reasons to not use important. <laughs> And one of the reasons is to do with um, specificity and which styles will, which CSS rules will actually override. So if we actually set something like this, body font size, to a really tiny um, pixel amount and set important, that's actually going to override pretty much everything, every style sheet from everywhere except a user-defined style sheet in which they also use important. So unless the user is, I guess, savvy enough to, one, write their own style sheets because they have like a special need and they need maybe all font sizes to be a certain color or a certain size, but they would also have to have also put the important tag on that style for it to prevail. So as much as possible, especially for styles like this, where, it's, where it could potentially be like an accessibility issue, I would suggest staring away from things like important because it can have that effect as well. And finally, this is just like a quick slide to show about the order in which you write your styles and how you can use things like fallback to provide progressive enhancements. So if there's any situation in which a style may not render because the browser the person is using um, would not support it. So for example, the RGBA style here, we can just provide fallbacks um, above. <clears throat> so finally, we get to the delivery of the CSS. So we've already decided that yes, CSS is the right tool for whatever it is we're trying to do. And we've used the best, most performance selectors and the best, most performance properties. And now we've written all our styles and how do we serve it to the user in the best way. Uh, just to quickly go back to the um, critical rendering path, we can see here that we have the CSS OM and then we have the render tree. So CSS is what is called a render blocking resource. And this means that we can't actually move forward with building the render tree until any CSS found on the page has been like fetched and actually read. And this is to do with the fact that CSS is cascading. So we can't actually just read the first few lines and then start showing the page because we could get to the end of the style sheet and then realize that, oh, the paragraph was meant to be read because this style overrid something else. So, um, it also becomes a problem when we have these large style sheets that has maybe like a thousand lines and um, takes forever to download and parse through. And so there are a few solutions to doing this and they kind of tend to fall into one of these two camps. So the first is modularizing CSS or preloading CSS. So when we talk about modularizing CSS, we have a few methods to do this. And the first is loading your CSS based on media types. And the more common way to use media queries at the moment is probably to just use the media query um, rule within your style sheets. So you might have like a paragraph is read and then you would put at media, I don't know, min width 600 or something and then change it to blue for um, the larger screen sizes. But another way we can actually do this is to have separate style sheets for those separate media queries. And if we put them within the head of our document like we have here, we can actually, um, the browser will actually only fetch the ones that are needed for that particular user's device. So if the user were to visit this page in a like a mobile device, they would only need to fetch that first one and that would be the only style sheet that's considered render blocking. And this is just a good way of reducing the amount of CSS that you're kind of forcing the browser to go, like stop what it's doing to go and fetch and read before it moves on. 
So another popular technique is inlining what is called critical CSS. And the just behind this is that you just take whatever CSS is needed for that first um, initial part of the page that the user visits. So when your page is, or your website is first loaded, whatever the user would see above the folds um, is what the styles for that is what we will try and inline right in the head of our documents. And then once everything has been loaded, then we can now fetch the full style sheets. So that way we're not blocking um, the rendering of that first page, fetching styles for things that we don't actually even need to show the user just that initial, like critical above the fold content. And another newish technique is actually adding your styles directly into the body. And this is a neat way to try and um, have things progressively show. So for example, I have a header here, and just before the header, I actually inline the styles for that header. And then as I go down, we have the main and the footer. And um, just a note of warning, this isn't, um, although it is in the specification at the moment, most browsers haven't really implemented it in a way that wouldn't cause um, re-triggering of parts of the critical rendering path. So it's probably not safe to use it just yet but um, you should like, look out for it, and hopefully soon we'll be able to do stuff like this and have really modular sections of our page. So the next part is preloading CSS. So the preload link um, is basically just a way to tell the browser to start fetching a resource, and in this case, a style sheet. So whenever we use link rel preload, we have to specify what type of resource it's going to be. And it's just a way of telling the, um, the browser to start fetching it because we're going to be using it soon. So you would have this here, and then later on in your document, you would also have the regular link to that same um, style sheet. And hopefully by the time the browser gets to that point, it's already downloaded it and parsed it, so it wouldn't necessarily be render blocking at that point anymore. And it's really useful, like the browser can set whatever priority it needs based on what resource it is, and so the browser can be really smart about when and how it fetches um, the resource. And then finally, we have HTTP2 push. And um, this allows us to kind of push more resources to the browser than um, that was actually requested. So in this example, we're just looking at whenever the browser um, requests an HTML file, it might also just send along this style sheet because we have told it that whenever it requests this HTML file, it probably also needs this as well. So it doesn't need to wait for the browser to then get to that point and then request it. So it's kind of just like going ahead of the, ahead of the game there. So just a quick review. So first of all, we're asking ourselves, is CSS the right tool for what we're trying to do? Because when it comes to the next billion users, we need to make sure that when we're doing things like content, HTML is what we're using because of accessibility. And when we're doing things to do with interactivity, that JavaScript is what we're using for that as well. Then we get to selecting the HTML, and this is where we think about the selectors we're using, the performance of them, whether we can use an ID instead of like a long nested chain of knots and attributes and all of that stuff. And then we have the declarations themselves. So what properties are we using? Do we actually need to use those properties, or can we use one of the older, more boring methods of doing what we're trying to do? And then we have the delivery of the CSS. So how can we modularize our CSS in a way that we're not forcing the browser to download absolutely everything in one chunk, and we're doing it in a way that's gonna be more performance for the user. So just to round up, um, I generally don't love the term next billion users, um, because it kind of implies that this is something that you do after you've gotten your first billion users. So maybe first of all, you should just get all the people who fit the stereotypical category of maybe being somebody in a developed country who has access to like 27 inch iMac. And then after that, you can think, okay, let's try and get the Africans or something. <laughs> so um, it isn't really something about, it isn't something you do after you've gotten 
the first billion users. And the whole concept of the first billion users doesn't even necessarily fit anymore because for all you know, the first billion users that access your sites aren't the people that you think they're going to be. They could all be people who are accessing it only using their keyboard or using a screen reader or using their mobile phones or, I mean, now you can probably browse with your watch. You can't really tell who your users are going to be. So thinking of it as something you only do after you've gotten those initial ideal users doesn't really work out anymore. And although it would be great to make a website that works for absolutely everybody on the planet, I don't think it's realistic to expect that. Um, we can definitely aim for it, but I don't think it's necessarily realistic to think that you are going to make your site work for absolutely everyone. I mean, the different projects that I do, um, I know that the users that I'm building for need different things. So for example, at the websites that I build at IO, our concern is more internationalization, so making sure that our sites work for people using um, in many different countries. And optimizing for some, a browser like Opera Mini, for example, isn't that important. But in the work I do um, working at Bitcoin, where the audience is Nigerians and Africans, optimizing for a browser like Opera Mini is like 50% of my job because that's what people are using. So it's more about figuring out who your billion users are rather than thinking about first or next billion users. Um, thank you. Thank you. Come and join us over on the seats. Okay. <laughs> Cool. So there was, there was a few things um, in that talk. I think one of the things that was interesting is this idea of people being determined to do CSS-only solutions. And I see this quite a lot, that almost thinking that, oh, the best thing to do is to not use JavaScript. Why, where do you think that comes from, this idea that JavaScript is somehow bad and, and actually might be less accessible? Yeah, um, I'm not sure exactly. I think it probably came from the concept that people want to make their sites also work for people in no JavaScript situations. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I feel like it did come from that good place, saying that um, you want to make your site more accessible, that means make it work without JavaScript. But people don't necessarily realize that kind of forcing CSS what it shouldn't be probably makes it less accessible. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. It, it, it's an interesting thing. You see this time and time again that, uh, yeah, it sort of, uh, you see these, these great techniques, but. They're good experiments, but maybe not, not so good. And, and so, you know, what would you say to someone who perhaps doesn't do JavaScript right now and is, you know, I'm a CSS developer, I don't really know JavaScript. Where do they get started with actually starting to bring a bit more of that into, the, into their work? Uh, that's a good question. Um, well, I think something like just really simple interactions. So, mm -hmm. for example, if you have, like, a model that you want to pop up, mm -hmm. right, um, using something... It can be really simple to get started with something like that. You can just kind of select the elements and mm -hmm. just open it, close it, or change the class. And that can be kind of a, re a gateway into learning more complex JavaScript. Mm -hmm. But I would say just the very, very simple interactions that maybe you could do with CSS, but it's probably better to just do it with JavaScript. Mm -hmm. Cool. So in terms of performance, you went through various different steps, things that people could be doing. Um, if someone really hasn't thought about making their site you know, more accessible or more performant and, and embracing more users. What are the kind of sort of first baby steps to get started? What are the kind of top things that perhaps someone could look at their site and say, well, I could target this right now? Hmm. Okay. Well, for accessibility, I would say use the correct elements. So mm -hmm. don't do what I did, where I did a div, <laughs> where I should have done a button. That's like the number one thing I would say. Just make sure you're using the right elements where you can and... That's also learning about things like the header elements and where can I use that instead of just using a mm -hmm. div. So I would say reduce the amount of divs that yeah. you have on the page. Um, for performance, um, well, I suggest just starting with one of these tools that um, analyzes your sites, so like mm -hmm. PageSpeed Insights, yeah. and they would generally give you a bunch of tips on that. But doing something like load CSS, which mm -hmm. will allow you to inline critical CSS and then just load the full style sheet, makes a huge difference. 
Cool, that's, that's yeah. really useful. I think it's, it's thinking about baby steps because there's so much that you can be doing yeah. and it can feel a bit overwhelming, can't it? So it's yeah. like, yeah, it's starting to get in and do, do something because something's better than doing nothing. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for coming cool. and talking to us. Thanks.